Hi, my name is Amy Hunnam, and I'm just an ordinary person. Um, I guess I'm making this video because I want my entire story to be told and yeah, it's the story of my um, my relationship with my hu husband and my sons um, and my experiences. Um, sometimes it helps to talk it out. And I know that it has been a very long time since I've told the whole story. So that's why I'm making this video. I don't know if anyone will ever see it, but I think it's important. It's important for me to get out everything. Um, I do have a counselor and a psychiatrist. I'm not ashamed to admit that. Besides depression and anxiety, I also suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I have some physical ailments that I have suffered because when my husband tried to kill me, he did some serious brain damage. And um, over the years, different neurological problems have turned up. Um, I suffered six concussions the night he tried to kill me. And he actually, for a little while, cut my oxygen off to my brain. Um, so um, I've had uh, chronic daily migraines since um, that first day. Some of them you just get used to, and then there's something you just can't get used to. Over the years, I've had different um, side effects from the migraines, nausea, dizziness, being off balance, and some other ailments. The last few years, I had a movement disorder, a tremor disorder, and then the, um, another movement disorder started affecting my legs and the tremors affect my hands and my body. And sometimes I just shake so uncontrollably, could be for 10 minutes, could be half hour or so, um, and I can't stop it. I no longer drive. I use a cane or a walker, or when I walk around my home, I hold on to furniture. It's small enough for me to do that. It's not very accessible um, for my walker. I'm 49 years old, and I need to use a walker. I um, am still waiting on hearing about uh, disability. Um, that would help me and my son financially, so we could finally move to a place that is accessible and affordable, and I would have a um, consistent income. In January of 1993, I met Robert Witkowski. We were both going to school. I had been going at the school for a while and he had started in January. Um, we were smokers. He is, um, it was a very, very small school. So anyone who smoked, smoked in this uh, small room and you kind of end up talking to each other. When I convinced my husband at the time that um, I wanted to take his car that was just sitting out there, kind of riding away. And I wanted to use that. I wanted to get my driver's license and I wanted to be able to go to school um, and drive myself. Once, once I had a car, <clears throat> uh, Robert had told me, well, his name is Bob. People called him Bob, so that's what I'll call him. Um, uh, asked me if I could give him a ride um, since uh, he moved back to his parents' house for a while and it was on my way. So I, I said yes. Um, it felt good to help someone out. Um, we talked and we became friends. 
And the closer we got, I told him about my um, relationship at home. And he helped me through the you know, social services system um, and what I needed to do to get out. He even helped me secure an apartment. Um, and what I didn't realize, it's funny that hindsight just kind of, you know, when you think about something in the past, you're like, oh, well, maybe I should have seen something. Um, when I moved into my apartment, he moved in as well. And that at the time was not my intention, but I was in a vulnerable state to where I thought, oh, well, at least I won't be alone. And he seemed like a nice guy. So um, that was the start of our relationship. Um, and I had my son, um, my son from my first husband. Um, I had to go through court battles and threats and things like that from his side of the family. And then I was, over the years, slowly they took away my son where I could only see him a few hours a week on a Saturday and Bob couldn't be around him. Bob never heard him. He treated him as if he was his own child. And there was one thing, no one was going to hurt my kids. And he didn't, though um, my ex-husband and his family made up stories and convinced areas that they were true when they were not. Um, eventually, over the years, we had our ups and downs. And I knew he had problems with drugs and um, there were a lot of times when he just kind of fell off the wagon. Um, there were times that I would do anything for him. So I did. And I'm not going to get into details. Um, they were regretful things. Um, when we had... Um, We had children. Um, and it uh, was a surprise because after my first son was born, I was told I probably would never be able to, be able to have children. Um, but I did. I had um, three, three sons with Bob. And like I said, we had. Sometimes it was very rocky and I thought about leaving, but I never did because he was the care, caregiver of the children. So, and I was working. And then when I came home from work, I took over. Um, it was like he was done. He did his job during the day for eight hours. And then the rest of the time, it was up to me to do the chores that hadn't been done during the day, take care of the kids, play with them, things like that. Um, my, uh, the three boys, they were all special needs in the beginning. Um, William continued to be special needs after that. Um, Bob and I were together for eight years. Um, because it took me that long to get a divorce from my first husband. We wouldn't, we had, he, it was like a book that everything was settled in, in family court and we had no assets between us. Um, he just wanted to delay it. He was, I don't know what he was. He thought sometime, at one point I would come to my senses and go back to him. He said, I would do that when I grew up. So I guess I never grew up because I never went back to him. I never wanted to. Um, he treated me, it, it was more emotionally um, abusive. Um, a couple of times it was physical when he forced me to do stuff that I didn't want to do, but he said it was my job because I was his wife. Um, but 
um, I got therapy for that when that was an issue after I left him and I was um, I was relieved when um, the divorce was final. Um, Bob on the line was doing cartwheels and being so excited, but it's like you, know, you look forward to something and then something happens. It's like, oh, okay, we're done. Um, but after that, um, I uh, continued to work and I had a really good job. And then I got a really good job offer. So um, once that job started and um, I was making more money than I've ever made in my life. And, um, and I worked hard for it. Um, we decided to move closer to my job because my job was about 45 minutes away um, and buy a small home. So we did that. And there, you know, we fixed up this house together. You know, we, we, we designed, it was a very small house, but it was enough for us two and our three little kids. And it had a nice yard and we had nice things and we fixed it up. Um, we almost doubled the worth of, of the home for what we bought it for. Um, things were going really well. Uh, we were happy. We were doing things together. You know, we were fixing up our home and I was working and I was bringing my own money. And after the bills were paid, we actually had money left over, which was something new for us. Um, during the time we were together, um, I had lost my mother. She died in 1997. And he helped me deal with that. Um, but I still had to be strong. I had to take care of my father and make sure everything was going well with him. And um, and then in 2004, early 2004, I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and I went through some treatments. And just when they thought it was, they called and said it was, it was uh, all gone. And then a day later, they called and said, oh, we called the wrong patient. You, you are still sick. And we need to undergo another treatment. So I did that. And I was out of work for about a week. I just... They told me, oh, you can go to work. Yeah, well, no, the treatment is worse than the cancer sometimes. So I, I stayed home and um, he took care of me. You know, he, he did things for me. And then it was, I finally got a clean bill of health for that. And things were, you know, they were okay. You know, he wasn't worried about losing me anymore, so things went back to normal. You know, he did his thing with the kids, and then he was done, and then I did my thing. And anytime something needed to be done with the kids, it was me doing it. I dealt with the schools. I dealt with anything that was related to them. I made the calls. I made the appointments. If I, they had to go to the doctor, I brought them to the doctor. And I feel like a fool sometimes. And I had always contemplated moving, but I was too afraid that they would be raised by their father. So I stayed. Well, I didn't want to go through all that all over again, especially since he had mother, money on his side of the family. And then 
In October of 2004, uh, 2004, his mother passed away. And then we just had to deal with we had to deal with his grief and we had to deal with all the money that he would inherit. And I always had a feeling that if he had a lot of money, he would not know how to deal with it. And I even told him when he got his money, put it in an account that doesn't have my name on it. And he said no. I said yes, because I don't want you to think I'm spending your money because I know how he thinks, even if he didn't remember how he thinks. I do. And then we got a new house, but only put some of the money into it um, to, to purchase it. And then we got a mortgage for the rest. Um, we moved in there in the middle of 2005. Kids switched schools. It was a really nice house and I loved it. But I asked him, I'm like, if we did not have this money, your money, your inheritance, would we, with just my income, would we be able to afford it and be able to pay our bills? And he was one, I always knew what our bills were, but he always, he was the one that figured out what money was going where. And he said, yes. So, I mean, I loved the house, but it was, it was big. And then and while all this is happening, I had um, written my first book and I really liked it. I had written short stories and poetry before, but it really got me like it got my creative stuff going. And then my first book got published. Granted, it was only a print on demand, but I didn't care. Um, it opened up a whole new writing world for me. Um, I was able to write stories and I used my time at night when everyone was in bed to to do that, to write things down. And when I got my first book published, he bragged about it, but I didn't know he was jealous of me. He told me at some point that he was afraid that, you know, if I became famous with a book deal or whatever, that I would just take the kids and leave, you know, leave them all alone. In the back of my head, I was thinking, well, if that ever happened, of course I would do that. But I knew that I wasn't going to be anything special. I was just a, a mom, an employee, um, and a wife. And that was just one little extra thing that I needed to do for myself. And it was losing his mother because it was like losing a second mother all over again. I was so close to his mother. He may have treated her like crap, but I never did. We talked for hours sometimes. And she was really close to my heart, and I'll never forget her. And when we moved, he fell into a depression because he kept spending and spending and spending and spending. And he spent $30,000 to redo that had the house had an in ground pool. I told him, he asked my opinion, and I said, dig it out, you know, get all that stuff out of there because it looked like a swamp. I mean, really, there were like dead frogs, and there were real frogs jumping around, and maybe. Um, probably some dead squirrels in there. I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was covered. It looked like a swamp. I told him to get it cleaned out, fill it. Just fill in the hole. And then if you wanted a pool, get something above ground. Our kids were so little, they, they didn't know how to swim yet. I'm not a big swimmer, so I didn't 
I ain't been in one to begin with. Um, he's like, no, no, he goes, we'll get it fixed up. And then it ended up costing a lot more money than he thought because not only did you have to fix what was destroyed and have it drained, you had to have it relined and re cemented and electricity put in and all that stuff. Um, it was $30,000 and he still owed the money to the electrician who every time I wrote a check to the electrician to, to, and have, to have him pick it up, I'd say, oh, I forgot we have, I have to pay for this or that. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, he was using the money to buy drugs. Like I said, I was never naive about my husband's drug problem. And, but I was really thinking, you know, when the money started coming up missing, that, you know, he was doing something. And I thought it was um, marijuana or even smoking cocaine a little bit. I didn't, I wasn't sure. Uh, I knew he was in a depression and he was in a downward spiral. spiral. In August of, um, actually, it was August 15th, my brother's birthday. Um, and I didn't remember the date until this past August. It just hit me. We were, um, the kids were asleep and we sat down. Uh, he sat in his recliner and I sat on the sofa where we sat. And he's like, we need to talk. And I said, I know. We've been putting it off. We have to figure out what we want to do next. He said, he goes, do you want to get a divorce? And I asked him, if he wanted to get a divorce. And he said, no, please, let's give it one more try. He goes, I'll be better. He goes, I swear, things will get better, you know? Um, so, and we had planned on at that point because he had the more money left that I knew um, we were going to sell the house. We were going to move to Ohio um, where I could work at the main company of where I was working. I was the only employee who worked in Albany for my boss who was in Ohio at the time. Um, nine, so it's a good thing I, I didn't do that because I lost my job two years after that. But anyways, um, so we planned on that. And even when you do that, you still have to pay your current mortgage. And he said he was paying the bills. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't paying the bills. Um, October. October 14th, 2005, my twins, they turn six. October 15th was our fifth wedding anniversary. And we fought. And he blamed me that we fought on our wedding anniversary, but I don't even remember what, what it was about, but I was, was walking on eggshells around him that, that last few months because I never knew if we were gonna fight or not. And I was tired of fighting with him. I was tired of our relationship. Um, I was tired of him being selfish. And only wondering about how much money I can make so he could have it. On October 
22nd. And I don't remember much about how it started or that day. He got mad at me. for putting his clothes away because I found his drug paraphernalia. And he hit me in the face a few times and then he hit me so hard that I was in our bedroom and he hit me so hard because I was in front of the doorway. We had a small bathroom off our master and he hit me so hard that I flew into the bathroom and smashed my head against the wall. When I came to, my face was swollen and really hurt. My head hurt and was, my ears were ringing. And I could only speak gibberish. He apologized, he, be he begged me not to call the police because I told him before, if he had ever done that, I would call the police on me. And he said, he told me, he goes, well, if you ever call the police on me, I'm not going to prison. I'll kill myself before I go to prison. Well, I told him, I said, if you ever hurt me, I was going to go to the police. Um, I was in the state of shock, and I drove myself to a nearby hospital. I couldn't speak. So I showed them my ID. And then slowly when I started getting my speech back, it, I was stuttering. And they asked me if I was normally a stutter and I said no. They asked me what happened. And I lied. I said I fell down the stairs. But I lied in a way so they would know that it was a lie. It's like they could understand. But I, I had to get home, I had my children to take care of, and I had to figure out how I was going to get me and them out. I mean, sure, I could have just taken off and gotten free, but my boys were still at the house, and Bob was there pretty much all the time. So I told my boss that I needed to, um, I was going to work from home because I had a little accident. Um, and I didn't tell him what happened. So, and I, I was lucky that I had a job where I could work from home. So I did that because I was you know, ashamed of the way I, I looked. And I was trying to figure out the best way to get out. And then he was being really extra nice. And the last few, you know, um, till the end of, of the month, he, he was being nice and kind and doing things around the house that normally I would do. You know, he was um, extra loving, things like that. On November 1st of 2005, um, I had come home to my friends' meetings. And then when I got home, I knew he was high. I didn't know what he was on because this was something that I've seen. I've never seen him like that. So I just kind of stayed, did my best and stayed away from him, things like that. Um, I tried to stay away from him, but he followed me around the house. Finally, you know, just what do you do? Like he was paranoid or something. And I was like, oh God, please just come down, come down, come down. I'm waiting for him to, you know, basically crash and just sit in his chair, drink a cup of coffee, and then get ready to go to bed. Well, he finally came down. And I walked over to the telephone and I picked up the phone book. That yeah, was a little phone book 
white and yellow pages. I had marked a page for um, you know, help if you have a drug addiction. Um, and I showed it to him and I said, I said, Bob, you have a choice. Your family or your drugs. He didn't say anything. He just stared down at the yellow pages. After a while, he watched TV. He didn't say a word to me. I put the kids to bed. And then we went, and he went to bed. And like normal, I, I always went to bed a couple hours after he did. Most of the time. The next day, I, um, that afternoon, I had to take some money out of the bank so I could go pay a bill. And I noticed that half of my paycheck that had been deposited the day before was gone. I had just enough money to pay our car payment. And I was like, oh, man, I didn't even have money to pay my mortgage. And this was November 2nd. And I came home. I fed the kids and then I told them to go out and play. I didn't hear them or whatever. And I wasn't even going to deal with them. I was so angry, but I was not going to do it in front of my children. And I didn't know what to expect. So I decided that I would, you know, I cleaned up the dishes. Kids were outside playing. A friend of his that was staying with us was downstairs. His older son was outside playing with, with the kids. Um, so I decided to make lunches for kids to go the next day. He came in from behind me. Asked me what the F I was doing. I said, I'm making lunches. I didn't turn around to look at him. And he said, you F and liar. And I said, no, it's obvious I'm making lunches. There's lunch box. I mean, it was completely obvious. He um, told me F and liar. And told me to look at him when I talked to him. And I turned around to look at him. And before I could look at him, he grabbed my ponytail so hard that he knocked me off my feet and he dragged me across the kitchen floor into the living room. He lifted me up on my ponytail so much that the ponytail itself had come out. He punched me so hard he fell out on the floor. He picked me up and did that a few times. I tried to get away. He threw me on the sofa. He sat on my lap. And he continued to just punch me with both his movies. I tried to block it with my own arms. And he got mad because I was trying to block it. I somehow managed to push him. And he, he fell over the coffee table and onto the floor. And my instinct was to go in our room and lock the door and then get out the window or something. Um, and he grabbed me before I made it to the bedroom door, which is right off the living room. And then he threw me on, we had an L-shaped couch and he threw me on the other side. And he did things that I don't always remember at one point. He um, tried to grab me by my shirt and it, he ripped my bra off from my body and he tossed it on the floor. And then he hit me several times. He grabbed my purse and he dumped it on the floor. Everything was all over the place. He, um, he opened my wallet and to a picture of him and he swore that 
it was a picture of my lover. And I said, it's a picture of you. And he said, no, don't lie to me. And that made him angry. He accused me of cheating on him. Then he accused me of planting bugs in the house. And then he would try to say, pretend that he didn't know who I was. Oh, you're not my wife. Where's my real wife? You're a fake. And at first I thought, well, maybe he didn't know. But then he pulled, um, I had a pile of manuscripts that I had written and printed out and I was editing and they were on the paper or they were piled on, on the coffee table. And he picked them up little by little and shredded them and threw them across the room. So I knew that him saying that it wasn't me was a lie because that would be the one thing that could hurt me, you know, rip up my, my personal work that I, I was doing. He took part the lamp, he thought the police were listening. And I said, if they were listening, they would have been in here by now. And he's like, don't lie to me. Another part, I tried to get to that, try to get to the bedroom. Uh, I got inside before I could close the door. He smashed my head against the wall. I don't know how long I was out. I woke up to him kicking me in the back and in the head and telling me to stop faking it. When I slowly got up, he got me by my ear and by this time my hair was all like this and clumps had been pulled out. He always grabbed me by my hair. And then when I got to my feet, he sat in his chair and I was watching him as I'm trying to stand on the floor. And he was just sitting there, he wasn't doing anything. So I thought, okay, maybe he's done and I'm getting the heck out of here. And as I slowly started to walk past him, He's like, where the F are you going? And I said, I was going to get a drink. He said, no, bitch, where you're going? You don't need a drink. He grabbed me by the hair and pulled, pulled me on his lap. He grabbed me around the throat. And then he smashed his forehead against mine. He was quite the head better. And after that, I kind of saw stars. And he wrapped his hands around my throat and his thumbs pushed right up against here. And I couldn't breathe. And I was looking in his eyes. I didn't even know where my glasses were. They were mangled somewhere. So I couldn't see, but I could see him up close. And when he looked at me, I saw the devil. I swear, his eyes, they used to be a beautiful blue, but all I saw was red. Hatred, and anger, and rage against me, someone he, he, he was supposed to love. Someone who begged me to give him a second chance. I gave him an ultimatum and he made his choice. He chose drugs over his family. Even if he didn't want me anymore, he still had three sons who up until that moment adored him. Anyway, I was losing consciousness and I thought I'm gonna die tonight because that's what he wants. And they say life flashes before your eyes when you think you're ready to die. And my death did. I could see myself on the floor with my sons finding me there. I could almost heal him dragging me through the woods and then hearing a shovel so that he would bury me and no one would ever know what happened to me and he would tell them some story about how I ran out on them or something. 
That's what I truly believed would have happened if I died. The kids would see me and then they would never see me again. When I don't know what that image of my boys seeing, seeing me dead, I got some kind of energy. I just lifted up my foot randomly and kicked him in the head in the instant they let go of me. I, I was just kicking him. I didn't know where I was going to hit. When afterwards, um, I, 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 can't, I somehow, my foot found his chest and I catapulted myself backwards off the floor onto the floor, off his lap. Then I ran. I ran through the kitchen. I opened the kitchen door and I locked it as I was going out. I, I um, ran and ran and ran. And I hid. I hid in the woods until it got that dark because I was afraid that he, either he or his friend would come after me. Later on, I found out I was right, but um, so I hid and slowly made myself, made my way through backyards and woods and it was cold. I had a light sweatshirt on, jeans, sneakers, no bra. The only thing I had on me was my um, cigarettes in my pocket and I used to be a smoker. And I would light the cigarette and then put it under my shirt to keep warm. So I used it for heat more than for smoking. And there was a time I was sitting there, I was so tired and I was cold. So I didn't quite feel all the pain I would feel later on. And my adrenaline was going and I just wanted to just sit there, just go to sleep. But then I felt my mom with me and somehow I just kept going. And Little did I know, I would end up at the back door of the state trooper's office. Um, I was about, I reached up to ring the bell, but I must have passed out. Um, I don't know how long I was laying there. Um, I woke up when a female um, state trooper was asking me if I was all right. And I just said, help me. And she called in and everyone that was there, they ran out. I gave them my information and wanted them to get my children out of there. I found out later what had happened there. One state trooper took care, very good care of my children, make sure they would get dressed and went to the bathroom and they had their coats and things like that. So they weren't just grabbed with blankets off the foster care. They were put in a group home. And that was after they were finally let in the house. Um, he was arrested and put in jail. And then 44 days after he was arrested, and in those 44 days, I had to heal. I was in the hospital for eight days. I had to get my children back and get my home in order. I had to get my home in order before I got my children back. I stayed with a friend for a few days because I didn't know what his status was going to be and I wasn't ready to walk in and clean up my own blood and him. My, some of my family, there was rumors that I had died. So I'm telling people who think I'm dead because they wanted to protect me so they didn't give any information. 
just a letter saying that my boys were in foster care. And they wondered if anyone would be able to take them, but they had their own kids. Yeah. And my boys, they needed to be together. So um, I'm glad that worked the way it did. They were, they were fine. I got to talk to them on the phone. And finally, when I got home, and went for good, I had to deal with my own issues and take care of my kids and make sure I would get justice. It took a long time. He was out of jail. A friend of mine had a friend of hers who was a legislator. And she heard my story. So it was her influence. And we did a press conference. Uh, we did many press conferences and interviews. And finally, the court date for his grand jury was set. And I testified at the grand jury. I met the detective who interrogated him, and I met the state trooper who took care of my boys. And ultimately, what happened was I was being taken care of. And they were very appreciative because after everything that happened, I sent them a letter to thank them. I didn't know individual names, but they took such good care of me and my, my children. I wanted to thank them for saving me. The state trooper mentioned the letter and he said that their major gave it to a, a copy of it to every officer who was um, on duty that night. And he said, we just helped because you saved yourself. And I thought, well, I have to be strong. I have to deal with this. I didn't sleep for months. I was on antidepressants. I, I saw a psychiatrist. I focused on my kids. When he was finally in jail, I focused on getting a divorce. But still, my kids needed me. And that's the way it had me. I dealt with my headaches. They were pretty bad. Some days they were ter terrible. Some days I would wake up and I couldn't speak. Over the years, it just got that worse and worse and worse. There's so much they don't know about the brain. But when they look at the MRI of my brain, they could tell where that there was some damage done because it's it's like there's scars that will never disappear. So maybe when I'm dead, they can study my brain to find out why all these wonderful, not neurological things happen just because somebody hated me. And that's the one thing that I don't know is why he hated me so much when he was supposed to live. I don't know. I know I need to get this story out. He finally was sentenced. It was on the news. Um, it started out in the beginning, all these news stations were on, but then slowly they, they uh, stopped caring about the story. You know, it wasn't, I don't know. Um, there was one news, uh, channel that actually um, did it from beginning to end. And one of the reporters was a neighbor of mine. So he would periodically come in and check on me once he discovered I was his neighbor. He was a very nice man. And I, I would tell him things that were going on and then he would put it on the news. And it wasn't my intention. He just, you know, he was probably being a reporter asking the questions. I answered them. And um, the only thing that I told everyone throughout the entire process is that my children were not to be involved. They were not to be involved in any legal process and they were not to be involved on the news, nothing like that. People knew enough because of me. They did not need to go through those experiences because of something they have so they saw or witnessed. Um, 
my sons are wonderful young men and they turned out to be just kind and generous. On November 2nd, 2021, it'll be 16 years. And that was the day my life changed forever. And even though I suffer, I think if my marriage was going to end, that was the only way it could end without him hovering over us and haunting us while he was alive. After he got out of jail, he was on parole. Um, I had heard that when he got out, he was, um, I don't know. Nine months after he got out of jail, he dropped out of a heart attack. A half an hour before Father's Day would start. So I had to tell my sons on Father's Day that their father was dead. And they just looked at me and said, oh, so we're safe now? And I said, yes. And they're like, oh, can we go back and play? And that was that. Sometimes I try to tell them the stories of when my father was good, but they don't want to hear it because they know what a man he was when he died and when he hurt us. He didn't change after he went to jail, after he went to prison. He was the same man who tried to tell him. And he was only sorry that he got caught. This has been Amy Shannon. And this was my story. If you see something, please say something. You don't have to call the police. If someone's being hurt, let them know they have some place to go when they're not alone. I learned that the hurtful. Thank you.